All right, everyone, welcome back to CIS 126. This is week uh, six. Yeah, it's week six of the semester now, and um, we're adding more to our project, of course. We last left off taking the left path. We're going to complete this side of it. So to remind you how the project is working so far, I will load it up here. Now, of course, we're going to add music to the project. That's the plan for this week. So imagine there's music playing on the various screens. We're going to have uh, some nice intro music happening here. If you go to the various screens, we can have different music playing. If I go to the help screen, for example, I can make different music play. Um, I can have some main music happening on the title screen and such. When the game starts, I want some other kind of music to play. I also want music, specifically sound effects, when I interact with the elements on screen, like this door opening up, I want it to be a nice creaky, scary sound. We'll add sound effects to interactivity. Uh, if I, you know, break the tree on accident, I want that to sound like wood is breaking. And specifically, of course, if I break into the window, I want a sound there. So we'll have sound happening, we'll have sound effects, so sort of a soundtrack and sound effects. That's going to be accomplished via code. We learned how to add music directly to the timeline back on part one. But the problem with that is that it, it does what it wants. You play that music, it plays on its own. In order to control the music, that's going to be code. Well, one of the ways we want that, of course, is let's say I go here and on the right path, I get eaten by the monster. Well, I get to the, to the bad ending. I want sad music to play here. So we're going to add music this week. Before that, we've got other things to do on the project, such as when I get to a bad ending right here, well, we're stuck. I have to start the game over in animate. But obviously, for a real game, it needs to be interactive within the game itself. So we're going to program in, in the bad ending, play again, or exit the game. If we get to a good ending, we want the same thing, right? Because at the moment, we can get to a good ending if we defeat the boss. But we're also then stuck at a dead end there. We're going to program those aspects of win the game or lose the game. Win the game. Okay, I won the game, but what else? Do I start over? Uh, do I exit the game, etc.? So we'll polish that. And where we last left off was taking the left path, which was related to random numbers, related to randomness in the game. Um, a game that is completely linear, that is always the exact way every time, will get boring eventually when you figure it out. But we set up a way here. When you start to go left, keys will randomly appear on the floor. One of them is the correct key. You pick it up, you can go to the exit. Now, what's incomplete here as well is that it is a, uh, there should be a time limit here. Uh, you've got three keys. There should be a time limit to pick up the right one. Spikes are going to come out and get you. That's going to be very similar to the right path where the boss was at. When the timeline reaches a certain time, it triggers the end. So you have to pick up the key within the right time limit. Um, once you pick up the correct key, it takes it to the good ending, and then you can start or restart. Now, obviously, this is a very short game. We barely went to any actual screens. I want to get the polish of the big ideas, moving from screen to screen, good ending, bad ending, and then we can go back in and add more polish, more rooms, of course. We also have to have the music. We have some requests of items to add to the game as well. Character select, for example. I think we're going to cover character select or start to cover it this week as well, as well as other items that were requested. So we were at the um, left path. At the moment, left path is set up for um, the random, 
random keys that appear on screen. What was cool about that was we learned, well, how do we get something out of the library? We have to set up an item in the library, give it linkage so that we can use code to grab it from the library, put it on screen. That was done by creating a graphic, a library item, uh, going to the properties, going to advanced, and exporting for action script with some kind of a name there so that the JavaScript can refer to it. We're going to do something similar to that when we do the character select. Well, once we add linkage to an item, we can then create a variable, a copy of it, giving it some name, referring to its type, which is the linkage, creating a new instance of it. And this is just weird, the syntax of it. It just has to be done this way. Notice that here we have the linkage, it's colon linkage, but then here we have new linkage, but here we have parentheses. As a beginner, you know, all of this jumbles up together. You might think, okay, uh, I need parentheses right here. That would be wrong. There's no parentheses here on the left of the equals. There is parentheses on the right. Here's another mistake. Well, I see that I did colon left keys here. It's a new left keys. That seems to make sense, but the correct syntax is it has to be with parentheses. Why? Well, it's just, it has to be that way. That's how it was invented when ActionScript was invented. But if you can remember that, that on the left, there's no parentheses, and on the right, there are parentheses, you'll be okay. And so we saw examples of that three times, create the second key, create the third key. So that's the syntax to do that whenever I want. When we do our character select, we're going to have our characters in the timeline, uh, in the library, and we're going to create an instance of it with linkage onto the screen. And then because this particular graphic has three keys, we have to say, which of the three keys are we showing? And via the code, <clears throat> we further said, okay, show frame two, show frame three, show graphic three, show graphic one, show graphic 90, easily. Position it on screen somewhere, X and Y coordinates, easy. Show it on screen. This is it. There it is in memory. Now there it is on screen. There it is positioned on screen. And there it is a particular frame. <clears throat> We're going to see that with the character select later. Those keys randomly across the screen, random numbers. We saw that math dot random parentheses creates a random number up to a certain maximum times a certain maximum. If I want to think of a number between one and 10, it would be random times 10. And I would think of a random number between one and between zero and 10, technically zero and nine. Um, and then we have to round it because it'll create fractions. A random number between zero and 400, and then between 80, between zero and 80, and then add 400. So that was just trying to figure out the region down here of the floor, a little bit of math. That places the second key somewhere within the ground area. Your values will be different if you drew your particular scene and the floor or the pedestal or the table or whatever is at a different location, then obviously my coordinates of 400 by 480 are going to be different than yours. If you need help with the math, call us over and we will help you with the math because it does require knowing your coordinates on screen based on the ruler. One of these three keys is clickable. The others are not. We can get more advanced by making all three of them clickable by all three draggable, pick it up, put it on the door. Ooh, that doesn't work. Let me get the next one. That one doesn't work. Let me get the next one within the time limit. That would be a little bit more game like, but I don't want to get that advanced at the moment. If you want to figure that out, you're welcome to, because we learned how to pick up an object. We learned how to do hit detection. So you might be able to figure it out on your own. If not, this version is enough. One of those three keys is the correct one.
Well, once we pick up the correct one to do, randomly pick the right key, stop the spikes. Okay, we need to set up spikes. You have the correct key, some kind of animation, and then remove the keys on screen. We saw that when we move from this screen to another screen, the keys stay there because computers are dumb. So I have to say, okay, don't forget to remove these keys from the screen. Child. And then... So I think we're done with this one. We randomly put keys on the screen. We saw that with random numbers. How about picking the right key? One of them had the event listener. Well, we need to stop the spikes. Uh, we need to animate some spikes. We remove the keys from on screen, so these are done. Spikes. Time limit. Similar to the time limit on the right hallway. The time limit happens from the timeline moving. Therefore, we no longer want a stop as our very first command on the left screen. So make sure you remove the stop there. Should have added a note. Uh, stop for testing. Must remove spikes added. Move it just by commenting it out. That means now I need a timeline. <clears throat> I need frames. I'll do the same thing. There's going to be about one second of pause, and then spikes will start to come out. And then within the time limit that I set up of the spikes moving, I need to pick the right key. So in the left screen here. Let's see. Interactive layer two. Um, I'm going to make a, a layer on its own layer two of spikes. Some simple tweening, just like I did tweening of the, uh, of the creature. Means work best when whatever element is animating is on its own timeline. We're going to pause for one second. One second is frame 24. So I'm going to extend my background to frame, frame 25. You can F5. There's nothing really happening on the interactive layer, but I will also extend it at 5. My code layer extended to 25. Spikes. On spikes, I'm going to start to animate after one second. So on frame 25, I need a new blank keyframe. Right click, insert blank keyframe or F7. So a pause for one second, then spikes will start to animate. Here again is where I choose. Do I want this to happen slowly, quickly, etc.? We know that our game, we have three keys. One is the right possibility. So we can click the right one Quickly, we know which of the three keys ourselves. We programmed it. We, we drew the three keys. We know which one has the event listener. When a person plays your game for the first time, they know nothing. That's why one of the bits of polish that we will add is a cutscene to help the plot along. But we will also add a little bit of a pause of one second before anything happens for someone to orient themselves. Starting on frame 25. Okay, spikes. There's lots of ways to do this, of course. The way I'm going to do this is um, I'm going to start with a basic lines. The way this will happen is, okay, imagine it like this. Um, like the first frame will be, uh, I'm going to do this, I guess, frame by frame too. I, I guess we could do it also with, um, with uh, tweets. But let's say first we, we see like little portals or whatever uh, openings opening on screen. And then it's going to animate that the spikes are going to start to, you know, come out a little bit. Then we'll tween it for 
them coming out further and further and further. So after some amount of time, um, they will completely come out and spike up the character. You know, big old spike. Um, spike hits you right there. So there's a lot of ways to do this. We can do this by frame by frame so that we make the spikes come out exactly as we want. We could do it via tweens. Um, tweens that they move onto the screen that would then require masking because they're coming through the walls. That might be more complex that I want to do. Uh, let's do them frame by frame. So on frame one of... Um, Uh, frame 25, but keyframe one, I'm going to draw the little, you know, within some areas, spikes will start to appear. So there's nothing then, the openings. It's going to be version one, I can polish it later. I'm going to do three frames at a time, three keyframe, uh, one keyframe and then three frames. So we're going to see something for one, we're going to see something for three frames and then the next frame. So uh, we have one, two, three, next frame, F6. So that then they start to come out a little bit. Obviously my previous frames, my previous layers disappear might want to add time for those because I know they'll need to exist. Got little holes opening up, then spikes are starting to come out. Skip three frames. F6, draw some more. So let's see, one, two, three, six. So um, very sloppy. You can draw them nicer later. Right now the point, the idea is that then animation starting to happen. Three at a time, one, two, three, and then the fourth. One, two, three, the fourth, F6, further out. Or the perspective, there's even spikes outside of the camera that are starting to come into view. By that time, the spikes got me, so <laughs> somewhere around there. Now this version one, it's very fast. You have the one second of pause to figure out what you're gonna do. And then suddenly spikes. And then the whole sequence of the spikes animating out happens from frame 25 in my case to 37. So about 10 frames, that's half a second, right? 24 frames per second, half of 24 is 12. That's half a second. This is happening in 10 frames. This is happening very fast. The spikes coming out and get you very fast. If you ever watch the Indiana Jones movies, right, on the first one, the thing's going to crush them. It's happening very, very slowly. And in any movies, things happen slowly enough to build sus suspense. It's happening way too fast. How do I slow it down? Add more time. I have three frames for each spike to come out. Three frames. That's like a quarter or, of an, or an eighth of a second. So very fast. If I want them even slower, well, what about for each one of these keyframes, I add two more frames. F5, so I can F5 twice. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I'm slowing down the spikes. 
That gets the point across. Spikes are coming not too, too fast, but they're coming. It's still, you have to do it fast enough. Two more, two more frames. I have two, a couple more times for each of these. Case, I extended it something like that. What's the correct number of frames? It depends on the effect you're trying to do. In total, all of this is happening in two and a half seconds. A very quick, a very quick um, animation here. Well, the point is at a certain point, the time limit of the spikes fully come out, then triggers go to the end scene. So somewhere just to round it off of three complete seconds, I'm going to extend all of these to three seconds with a new blank keyframe F7 on um, frame 72 on my action script so that I can write the code to move to the bad ending. is on frame 75 or 72. This is at the end. This is on the left hallway at the end of the animation. My case frame 72. And I'm adding the usual movie clip. This route. You've seen that over and over. You should start to be memorizing that possibly. Go to and play. The actual command to move around with that particular spelling, where if you only put a number, it assumes the current scene or the current symbol. Then you add the comma. No, I actually meant another scene. So whatever the scene, the other scene is, SC and bad. So from the main timeline, we're gonna go to the end if we reach the limit, the timer in a sense. Spikes come out, I didn't get the key in time. Well, spikes got me, I go to the bad end. That's very similar to what we did in the boss. What we also needed to do in the boss, uh, the, the right side was, remember, okay, the boss is coming at us. We defeated it, so we removed it from the screen, but we also stopped the timeline. Same thing here. Well, there's nothing really to remove if we get the key. I suppose if we get the key, then that might be a good idea, actually. If we get the key, then we make the spikes retract. Yeah, let's do that, actually. I just thought of that. Let's make the spikes retract. Yeah, let's do that. Let's make the spikes retract. We got the right key, so the spikes go back to show that we got it. And uh, the way we will do that is that'll be useful to, to show about reversing frames of animation. Uh, did you ever notice if you right-click on, on any of these frames, uh, you might see the uh, reverse frames and wondered what that was. So we'll use it here, actually. So this will be different than previous semesters, actually. Uh, this time, when we get the key properly, we will reverse the frames. So the way we will do this is a little bit of setup. Um, we have animation happening of the spikes coming out. Okay, we'll need animation for the spikes going back. So I'm going to copy all of these frames of the spikes coming out and then right-click reverse. So the way I'll do this is I will click and drag to select all of these frames. Specifically, of course, the, um, the keyframes, the black dots, right click, copy all of those, copy those frames. Same spike layer, then I will right click paste. Paste frames, paste over right should do the same thing. I'll just do paste. That copies the animation of the frames coming out. I need the I need these spikes to go back. 
So those frames that I just pasted, I can select them all again, right click, reverse frames. Spikes are going back. I selected and copied all the frames of my animation moving forward. I then pasted them at the end here. Once they are pasted, I then reverse them. Right click reverse. So conversely here, when they reverse at the end of the reversal, I then need them to um, Do they reverse it back into the wall? Then from here, I move to the good ending. If I trigger hitting frame 72 without picking up the right key, that triggers the bad ending. If I picked up the right key, I want to play the spikes going backwards, going away. And then when they go away, take us to the good ending. So in my case, frame 100 of the action script, I need a blank keyframe there so that I can play instead the... Uh, to good ending. Just to write some notes here within the bad ending, if I reach my, if I reach the end of the animation of the spikes, I could say, uh, didn't grab correct key, go to bad ending. Whereas if I did grab the right key, the right, the correct key, first spikes, go to good ending. Just to polish things up with some comments. Logically, you might be thinking of something here. We have the animation that will start to play. It'll trigger bad ending if I don't do it in time. If I pick up the right key, well, I need to program it to skip the bad ending and go to the reverse spikes, good ending. So the code to do that, to, con to change the flow of the, of the timeline, after I get the correct key, stop the spikes, do the moving animation. Um, I had the code here. As soon as I pick up the key, go to the good ending. And I remove that because I want to play the animation of the spikes going away. And at the end of the spikes going away, we've got the code to go to the good ending. So removing that, moved the go to good ending to after spikes retract animation. In order to trigger all of that, then we need to jump to the portion of the timeline where that, where that happens. In my case, I started to make the spikes retract on frame 73. So I'm going to jump over the bad ending and start the retraction animation on frame 73. In my case, if your frames are different, you need to write yours. So go to and play on frame 73. Keeping frame 72 where the bad ending happens, jump to frame 73 and play from there. Play the retraction to get to the good end. Here's an example of logic errors could happen instead of uh, syntax errors. You know, none of this code is particularly 
complex to do what I need it to do, but logically it is because I'm jumping over the bad ending uh, that is going to happen based on the timeline. And then at the end of that animation, that takes me to the good ending. Let's see. Save it. I'm going to test my code. First, I'm going to test that I that I don't get the keys in time. And then I'll test that I have that I got the right key. So I want to make sure the bad ending works first as as I would expect. And then I'll test the good ending. And then we and then I have to restart the game, of course, because I didn't program it to restart the game. But we get into the house, we go to the left. Okay, I'm gonna let the time limit run out. So we have one second pause, spikes are coming. Bad ending. Take us to the bad ending. Got to remove those keys because unless I tell it, those keys or anything you create from the code will stay on screen until I remove it. So it'll polish there. Uh, go to the bad ending, but first remove the keys. And I'll test the good ending that I got the key in time. So the keys don't go away because I previously had make the keys go away when I pick up the right key. To remove the keys from the screen, put it at the part where we didn't grab the right key. Trigger frame 72, where the bad ending happens. First, remove the keys, then move us to the bad ending. While you test your game, even though you're testing a new idea, if it's feasible, you can test the old idea just to make sure it still works, and then test the new idea. The old idea was, yeah, it, it properly worked when my time would run out, perhaps, uh, but now I'm testing it again. So. Let's see here. If when time runs out, yep, remove the keys, move to the good ending. I mean the bad ending because of the, the spikes got me. So if I try to get the right key within the time limit, the right key because my zoom got in the way. <laughs> Definitely want to program that restart because you have to restart it every time. A real game, you would be able to restart the game from the game. And it kind of all happened fast, but you're, you're getting the idea there. I picked up the right... Um, Pick up the right key. It happened quickly, but then the spikes retracted. When I got to the end of the, um, when I picked up the right key, then it jumped over to frame 73. It replayed the animation of retracting. When it got to the end of that, then it went to the good end. The testing phase, obviously this is happening a little too fast. So ways to slow it down and such. Add more time here, add some tweens, make it slower, et cetera. More frames mean a slower animation. Less frames mean a faster animation. So what I could do before retraction, well, I can make the retraction even slower. A couple more frames on each. I then need to make sure I extend all of these to match. They're going to retract. Technically, I probably don't want to replay the animation where the spikes are fully extended. 
Um, because after a certain point, obviously, when they extend that far, the spikes kill me. But if I picked up the right key in time, I probably don't want to replay the animation from them fully extended. Remove the first two parts of the animation for more polish later. Let's see how that works. It happens pretty fast, but that can be polished a little bit later. The idea is to set up a system where, again, we're controlling the timeline. Normally, we get to this frame. Since we don't have a stop, it's then going to start to animate here. We have this, this time limit that we've set up via the timeline. If we trigger a particular frame, we get to the bad ending. We didn't complete the task in time. If we do get the, if we do complete the task, we jump to another portion of the timeline you know, right here without me having to actually make any changes I'm gonna, I'm gonna without making any changes to the timeline I'm gonna make a change to my code because yeah actually I guess I really don't want the spikes of they're fully out then they retract so I'm gonna instead of jumping to frame in my case frame 73 I'm gonna jump to frame 89 where they're not fully extended so I'm just gonna ignore what I've done in the timeline there of those two fully extended frames. I'm gonna to jump to the timeline where they start to retract. I can even go way further out even over here or redraw them, of course, also. Um, but let's say I'm gonna skip from, they're coming at me and then they, and then I jump to that point that they start to retract. In that case, frame 89 is what I need. Instead of what I had here of 73, because in my case, I don't like how that it's starting to play where they're fully extended. Two spike retraction animation. It's about stopping the spikes. Done. Some kind of animation done. Get key, getting the correct key has been changed too. Remove all of the keys off of the screen so that I don't, I don't see them on the next scene. Jump to frame whatever of my timeline to play the you're safe animation. And then when that ends, when that triggers to the right place, then jump over to the, um, to the good ending. And like I said, we previously had stop. Make sure you remove that or no spikes will ever come out. On two good ending, bad ending, they're dead ends at the moment. I no longer want them to be dead ends before that. Uh, Questions, comments on this at this point. Does that make sense a bit on that left path? It's a reiteration of the of the um, time limit via the boss and then jumping around on the timeline a bit.
Now in other coding apps, there, there's a way to show more than one uh, chunk of code at a time. Uh, you could have you know, your top part of code and a bottom part at the same time on the same screen. Unfortunately, on our animate uh, coder, uh, you can only view one screen at a time. But if you use other languages, other apps to code, uh, other types of projects, you can often have more than one screen open at once. One way to kind of do that, show to see two things at once, is you can use a separate kind of app because we've also got other apps on these particular computers. We have VS Code and we have Notepad++. I kind of like Notepad++ as, uh, as a sort of faster coder editor than... Uh, VS Code, so this is off a little off topic, but if you ever want to see two chunks of code at the same time, you could open another coding app. And then let's say from animate over here, I can do a select all and copy. And then in my other coding app, I can paste it in there. Um, if you also want the colors to show up, something like Notepad++, you can look at it under language, with this particular app, you can code in all of these languages. We're in ActionScript, of course, so then we get colors. You can also zoom in and zoom out. The point of this is that sometimes I want to see two codes at once. Uh, Animate only lets you see one at a time, unfortunately. But with another app, you can, you know, you can have two apps open at once. You have to kind of juggle your screens around a little bit. But you can have one, uh, one app showing some of your code and then animate showing your code. And maybe I should have mentioned that early on also in the semester, that way you can view my code and your code at the same time to compare instead of jumping between app, uh, jumping between panels. Sometimes it's a little harder to jump between panels and animate. It might be easier to, to jump between or compare apps of code. All right, so here's some new code we're gonna look at. All of this we've done at the moment it has been examples of things we've seen before. What I wanna do is we, um, we're gonna to go to a good ending or a bad ending, and then we either want to exit the game or restart. So let's set up a way to restart the game or exit the game. Uh, we're gonna set up first exit the game. That one's a little bit more straightforward. So in, um, I'll start with the good ending. Let's say on the good ending, once I get to the end, okay, well, I'm done with the game, I want to exit. So we'll set up a button with an event listener. And when we click that button, we run new code that will exit the game. So I'm in the good ending, I'm going to create my interactive layer. To create a button. Or how about we use the button I've previously had over here. So in my case, in my library, I have generic button. What I did at one point in generic button, I have start the game, go back, gibberish. And I had an exit here as well. You may have set yourself up this way or not. I would consider that you do set yourself up with some generic button. Uh, symbol, and within it, you have all of these possible buttons, then we can easily show the correct button when necessary, the correct graphic. If you don't have a generic button, you'll need to create a um, specific button in your library. In case I, I'm going to reuse my generic button and set it to the correct um, the correct in uh, the correct instance of it. So, oops. So I'm putting a copy of that generic button via the code. I can say which frame to display. Well, we need that to have an instance name, so that we can know, so that the code can know which frame to display out of my several. So after I drag a copy onto the stage, we will call this um, 
it's just a button, BTN. Uh, it's um, and good exit. Ending screen. Good ending. And it's my button to exit the game. So you'll see when we do the bad ending, there'll be an instance and we were going to call that button and bad exit. So that's a very detailed instance name, which I recommend you use. If you just call it exit, it might work, but some words that are very simple are often reserved by the app for their own special commands. You know, I could call a button. I could call a box where you're going to type your name. I could call it name because you're going to type your name into it and put your name into the game. The, na the word name is reserved for action script commands. How would I know that? Well, you could look up on the help system. Um, you know, if you ever follow the help, the help manual for action script and look through there, it'll tell you there somewhere. These are the reserved names. One way to not have to memorize all the reserved names is to not use very simple names. Uh, name is a simple name that is built in. You know, what if I want to call this random? We saw before, and it's even going to tell you right there, that is a very reserved name. Please don't use that. Uh, so it might not tell you for all of them, but if I need to call something random, I could call it, you know, my random, or I could call it, you know, the random. I could put my initial on it, random. And then now it is a completely unique name that is not built into the, the language. Uh, this is going to be my button to exit. Exit is, is a reserved command. It didn't pop up to complain, but we should avoid it. So that's why I give a button exit. I'm going to have a button to exit the game in more than one place. In each instance name, each object needs to have its own unique instance name. So maybe exit one. But as I want to call it, I am very detailed instance names. Now that this has an instance name, I can write the code to say, actually, why don't you show the button of the exit, which in my case is frame two. So I can say that object is what I wanted to do is to uh, go to and stop on frame two of the of that instance. In my case, my frame two is the one that shows the exit button. It'd be nice. I'm not sure if there's a way to do it, but it'd be nice that it would show that as you're programming it. Because when we do the character select, we're going to put all our characters into one symbol. We're going to write code that says, you know, sh show my mage character, show my wizard character but it's not going to show it on screen until you play your game. I don't think there's a way for it to, to dynamically have it show that until you play it. I guess you can do control test scene. Is that going to work or going to cause weird things? Yeah, I guess you can do test scene. It's not going to be interactive. It's just going to show it to you. It kind of defeats the purpose because as we do the debug movie, you have to start from the beginning and play your game until your frame, until your scene 50, unless you program a shortcut. Um, quickly, you can do a control test scene to just see it and it'll play its animation and such, but it won't do any of the interactivity. This is just at least for me to see that, yeah, I put the correct scene of that button. Right, so that button. It's going to display the exit. That button needs code so that when I click it, stuff happens. Done that several times. I'm going to go back to my example code back on frame one, scene one, about set up a button clickable. I'm adding that. And as usual, this has something here and here and here. If something is that instance name. Now that has a listener, we're going to play, we're going to run some more code. 
This will be function in the ending, which is the good ending. This will be to exit game. But as exit, I suppose. But being very obvious, what is it actually doing? It's exiting the game. This is being obvious, saying that there's a button, something about exit. And here specifically, it's about exiting the game. going to program this two different ways. Version one is you click exit, we exit. Version two, it's going to ask, are you sure you want to exit? If they then say, yes, I want to exit, then exit. If they say no, then I guess we can further program it. Do you want to start over? Do you want to go to easy mode? Million possibilities. We'll do the basic, yes, exit. Then we'll exit with a question. Exiting the game is one specific command typed in a very specific way with specific capitals and such. Before that, we will say about to exit the game, easy mode. I want to, I want to say this, no, no confirmation. Version that we, for, that, that we then confirm. It's, and it's here, native, capital N, application, capital A. Right, so there's a specific command, native application. This is just their way of saying that if this is running on an Android phone or an iPhone or a tablet, let us access the native features of the tablet, the phone, etc. The phone has native features volume control buttons, it has power button and such, it has vibration, it has these native features. So we're about to access native features. Uh, specifically, native application, lowercase n there. Why? That's just the way it was invented. Capital A for application. Why did this not change color? That's another... That's just the way it is. And then dot exit. Oh, exit. I, as I said previously, there's a built-in command that we should avoid because it's a simple word, exit. Parentheses and then zero. That's a zero, not an O. And I'll make a note here. Note, that's a zero, not an O. Very, very similar, of course. There's a zero, there's an O, lowercase, there's an O, uppercase. You look at them all together and I didn't tell you which was which. Very hard to tell which is which. That. Right, so this command here, exit the game. Times when we need to do something like this, it is better to set up an, are you sure? We'll do that on the second one, the, the bad ending. But on this version, it is simply that. As soon as you tap it, exit the game, no confirmation. It's a little bit more polished to add confirmation. We'll do that one in a moment. So let me test that, get to the bad ending. Get me. Oops, we did this on the good ending. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, okay, let me do that again. The good ending. On the good ending, we have exit the game. Here we are at the good ending, true boss is defeated, enter good, exit. Down on the timeline, uh, down on the output panel, it said what I needed to say, but then it closes and you can't even see it really. 
but this trace message appeared for a moment and then it exited. So the um, code worked. The point is there was an exit button. I pressed exit. I exited the game. I'll do the same thing for the bad ending, but then add the, are you sure? And then, um, then we'll take a break. So very, 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 very similar code. Going to be some button that I'm going to click on to run some code. So that's going to be on the good ending. Bad ending. So on the bad ending, I need to place an instance of the button. That new instance on the bad ending needs an instance name, BTN. This is a button. This is related to the end screen, related to the bad end, and it is my exit button. <laughs> Giving it that instance name, now lets me, of course, display the correct, um, the correct uh, frame, in my case, frame two. I need that whole events listener stuff. Click on the good ending uh, set uh, button to exit the game without confirmation. Just exit versus the one we're going to create here in the bad ending, set up a button with confirmation. First, confirm. They really want to exit. This will have a conditional statement again, if else. We've seen that before. And it'll be the exit code if they choose if they choose true. Something else will happen if they choose false. And so on this particular screen, this particular button, instance name, name of a function, name of a function. Particular instance name, make sure it's the instance name of this screen. If you're using the instance name from the other screen, you're going to get errors. Basically, remember, any code that exists in a scene or a frame relates to the thing visible on the screen. So more advanced people might say, well, can't I reuse code throughout my app? Yes, if you set up all of the code the right way on the first frame of the first scene. If you set up all your functions on this first scene and then just use the event listener properly on the right scene, that's a way for you to consolidate all functions in one place. And then it's just a matter of putting the event listener in the correct scene or frame. That's a bit more advanced. We're doing it as a beginners because 99% of you are beginners. We're bundling the listener and the function together in the particular screen where it's needed. A more advanced way is to consolidate the functions in one place and then use the listeners where necessary. Case here, bad ending. This is function of end, which is good. This is to exit game.
out. Exit. Gabe, ask confirmation first. So on this one, we have the true false. And this one, we have true or false. True, they want to exit false, they don't. In order for that to, um, to happen, well, we need a pop-up on screen. That then requires all of the setup of making a um, of making a uh, making something appear on screen, which can be done in many ways. We could we could create an object in the uh, library and then display it on screen at the right time. We then have to create an object in the library, give it a linkage, um, create an instance of it via code place it x and y coordinates all that stuff so instead we're going to make it appear on screen here as an as an object on screen and the way that will work is by jumping to different points in the timeline uh, frame one is going to be this screen here frame five is when the is when the um, pop-up appears um then the uh then the yes, I want to exit, no, I don't want will appear. And then when they click yes, the code will then exit them or not. So we need to set up that on frame five. A new interactive element. Uh, let's see here. New, uh, new layer, we we'll call this pop-up. Keyframe. Draw a pop up. Put some text. Are you sure you want to exit? Just use the plain old fonts. Do you see this is why I did the version back on the good ending of just click it and do it. And here, okay, I just wanted to ask a confirmation. Look at all this setup that we have to do um, just to get it to work. So this is reminding you that there that there's always just there's always more than just um do it there's a you need to set it up and such what i'll do is um see pop up box pop up buttons um, yeah we'll do it that way pop up box buttons So when we click that, when we click the exit, it'll jump us to this frame here. This frame, then I have two buttons of yes and no. So my timeline is set up here, just to show you in my case. Um, simplified perhaps, but uh, don't be afraid to use multiple layers to, to get the job done. So my background is on its own layer. The first interactive button is on its own layer. Uh, I want to keep that on. I want to keep that button the same throughout because it's going to be the same instance, um, the same instance of the exit button. So every time I add a new copy, a new a new frame that is a copy of a frame, it's going to make a copy of the button with the same instance name, which is a waste of effort. Instead, if I keep it as the same instance visible throughout that's more efficient 
I jump over to that frame there. I've got a blank keyframe there where I drew the, the background, new layer, new keyframe where I'm going to draw the yes, no. And then um, the code there. Um, so we've got yes and no. Super simple for the moment. Yes. I don't want to get too complex at the moment. This is going to be clickable. Remember, whatever, wherever you click, make sure there's a place to click. If a person's clicking right here in between the, the emptiness of the Y, there's nothing to click there, so that won't work. Uh, it would be better that I make a whole shape and fill in colors and all that, of course. But for the moment, I'll start, the, start them like this, yes or no. These have to be symbols so that then the JavaScript, uh, the action script can attach to them to con continue my code. So these convert to symbols. Let's see, call this. Button and uh, is in the bad ending. Uh, a button and if it's if it's just related to the endings, I guess I don't. If I'm going to use the same buttons for the good endings, bad endings, I don't have to be specific. It's just for endings. Buttons for endings, yes. And the button for ending, no. Just need to turn them into symbols. Later on, I can put a background and all of that. These in, these need instance names. So that one I'll simplify it as and yes and no. So from here, these will trigger a yes or a no, a true or a false. Hey, that goes back to Boolean data types, yes or no, true or false. Yes is true, no, no is false. So back on my code here. About to exit game, ask confirmation first. Okay, well, the, the pop-up happens on frame five, so I need to jump to frame five. Stop on frame five. That'll make the pop-up appear. Then if we if it jumps us to that frame five, click on yes, it'll run code to exit the game. If we click no, it'll run code to close the pop-up. So showing the pop-up is on frame five, closing the pop-up is on frame one. So here now, these need to be clickable. The code. Copy this chunk of code because I'm about to reuse it twice. So we have the button. Yes. Well, function exit yes. Similar, the opposite in a sense is the button no. See here, I'm taking advantage of copy and paste. It'll be very simple. A copy and paste is very powerful with programming.
So these chunks of code are things we've done over and over and over. They have their unique instance names and their unique function names. The concept is that one will, yes, exit the game and the other one, no, don't exit the game. Yes, exit. That's the code from the simple version. It's on the good. It was this whole native application. Copy that. Drive fully confirmed. Actually, yes, I do want to exit. We'll exit. If I then click the no, there's the true, here's the false. And then the false is going to take me back to frame one where the pop-up is closed, go to and stop frame one of this scene. Check there. Once I get to the first frame of the bad ending, there's no pop-up. The pop-up exists on frame five. Once I click the exit button, the timeline moves to um, frame five. And then from frame five, now the buttons are clickable and we've got true, exit, false, close the pop-up. Jump back and forth between these two frames. For the user, a pop-up appears on screen. But for the uh, for us programmers, we're, we're looking at it and jumping between a couple of frames in the timeline. Save and run this. Whoops, got a little error there. Duplicate function definition, okay. What is that about? So I have I duplicated something somewhere, so I'm gonna double click it without thinking. Uh, good exit game back on the bad. Oh, that was probably back. Yeah, that was on the good ending. Okay, so there I'm showing. On the good ending, I exit the good. I'm trying to exit from the good, from the good um, ending screen. So I've got a function related to it, but I'm in the bad ending here. So exit and bang. So that was a syntax error, but it was more of a logic error that I cannot have the same function more than once unless I set it up properly. Oops, and then I got these access to undefined property, yes and no. Uh, what is that? So right here, it's claiming that it can't find those. Did I name these things right? Even if I just typed it 10 seconds ago, I forgot 11 seconds later. End yes, so I called it end yes, not button yes. Okay, so it's telling me you called your things wrong. Button yes, button no. Not sure why I used that logic for that moment, but that makes sense. Button for yes, I've got a button for no, and then my code rep represents that. So it's good that I got those errors just so that I can also show that obviously I'm teaching this, but I can make a little mistake and notice how then I use the error panel to help me. All right, so this is happening on the bad end. So I need to lose, go to the bad ending. The bad ending. The exit should take me to frame five of the bad ending to make the pop-up. There's the pop-up. Click the no. Now, if I click right here, there's nothing clickable there. I click on what I, what, the symbol is, like in that corner, let's say. Click it. Closes the pop-up. But what did that do? It went back to frame one where there is no pop-up. Click the exit again. It jumps to the pop-up. Technically, if I click the exit here, technically I'm replaying the jump to frame five. So what I probably should do here is when the pop-up appears, make the exit button disappear. This is just again for the polish, you're not going to have any console output when the game is actually playing. But as I'm testing it here, I'm seeing these little rough around the edges things. Every time I click it, 
technically I'm jumping to frame five. I'm already at frame five. Um, but no, I jumped to frame one. When I click exit, I jump to frame five. I probably want to, easy answer is just remove that graphic on frame five. Anyway, then we want to check yes, and then yes exits. So what I was saying was, when I'm here and I click exit, it jumps to frame five, pop-up. If I've got the pop-up, I probably don't need to see the exit because it's in, it's still interactive. I could turn off interactivity for this moment, but that's too much prob too much setup. So all we could do is just blank keyframe there. The only thing to interact with on screen is the pop-up there. There's no exit. Why click exit? You're interacting with this pop-up. I click the no, it jumps back to frame one where there's the button again to make the pop-up appear. And if I click the yes, true, then I exit the game. Same result in the end, but with a little bit of more polish of, well, don't show the button that you don't need so that there isn't code running that you don't need. I am out to exit. It's going to confirm yes, no, true, false. No button over there to distract. But no. Yes, close the game. So this should be an example of when I play someone else's game, when I work. When I use someone else's app, then there's glitches, there's weirdness, there's uh, rough edges. Someone had to think of all of those things and fix those things. Now you, as the designer of this game, you have to think of all of these things and these possibilities. And I know the, I know the uh, workflow of my game but you have to put yourself in the shoes of someone else because I know that when I'm here, why would I click the exit button? That's not the point. I want to click yes, no. But someone else may think, what if I click exit, even though I'm asking yes, no? Well, it's trying to exit. We don't need the button, so I removed it. And I have to program. It just It's not just a simple question, yes, no, true, false. I had to program a pop-up with buttons and a function for each and then it finally does it. So the point of this is, as you make your game and test your game, and you think, yeah, it's foolproof. I programmed it exactly as it should. You're going to find out nothing is foolproof because there's so many ingenious fools out there. And those that accidentally do things that weren't trying to break your game. But they found something that you didn't think of. And that's part of the process of beta testing your game. So let's do our first break here. Um, the break after that, we'll do one more thing in the, in the endings. Restart the game. That won't be too complicated. We'll do that. And then we will do starting to set up character selections. See how our time goes. So uh, it's one twenty-five. We'll take a ten-minute break, and then we'll continue.
All right, everyone, let's continue. So here we've got the uh, exit the game after we get to either of the endings. Um, we might want to restart. So specifically on the bad ending, when we get to the end here, let's restart. Now we're going to set it up, of course, version one, restart from the beginning. Well, on, a, on another game, on other games, you kind of start at a certain point, you know, a save point or something. That, of course, can also be set up. But we will set up um, as a starting point, restart from the beginning of the game. You know, we're going to make it Nintendo hard, where you have to start all over all at the beginning. And later on, we can make it, I don't know, iPad kid hard or something, where we'll start with a save state or something. So um, starting over here, we need a button to start over. And um, I'm going to start with the bad ending first. So in my case, I don't have a specific button for good ending, bad ending. I mean, uh, for restarting within the endings. Um, I can reuse the generic button and add to it. I should have actually done that with the yes or no to exit pop-up thing. That would have been more efficient to uh, create one symbol and then show yes or no as necessary, uh, like the generic button, but I did it that way. Anyway, so then for the uh, restart, on restart the game, I'm going to add another frame to my generic button. In generic button, I currently have um, start, exit, back, map. And then I guess I'll make a brand new one, frame five. So I'm going to borrow my graphic for start the game and set it up as, as um, restart. play that better later but we've got a restart on in my case frame five of my generic button so then on the um, bad ending copy of that button onto the screen happening on frame five so that needs an instance button and bad restart as the instance name button and bad restart that new instance needs to play on frame five So that's got its go to and stop frame five. They then need event listener plus function. I could take the generic one from the title scene, or I can copy the one from here. Both need to be changed, but I'll I'm here already, so I'll copy the code from this one, which needs to change, of course. This needs to change, this needs to change, this, this, and something here, and then here. So, depending how fast you can type and copy and paste and such, maybe the way I did it here, or copying it back from the, from the title scene. The way we need, once again, that to be the instance here which runs some function, function and bad exit game or restart game. Um, function and bad restart game. 
logic there. I'm just following the conventions I already set up previously. This is the bad ending. This is about exiting game. This one's about restarting game and all of the thick boilerplate. So all of that's been done before. To do the starting part, we're going to add a little bit of code that won't make sense for the moment, but I want to add it here so that we don't forget it. And then be more important later. So we haven't done the sound, but I want to add a little bit of code about the sound before we forget. Because sometimes you can um, you can forget code, and then it doesn't work as expected. So uh, this will be here to do when sound is set up. Normally, I would then add it as a comment. I want to add it as a regular line of code. It will be running, but it makes more sense once sound is set up. But we can still set it up even though we don't have sound yet. Uh, so this will be sound with a capital S, mixer, capital M, and then dot stop, lowercase, all capital A, parentheses. This command stops any sound. So this will be this will be more important later once we actually set up sound. But this is the code to stop sound. Um, normally, when we learned back on part one, sound happens when it plays on the timeline. If we set sound to um, over the options instant and event and such, the sound just starts playing on its own. If we set it to stream, the sound is going to follow the timeline. And when the timeline ends, the stop sound will stop. Via code, everything that I can do visually, I can do through code, basically. Something's easier than others. And so one way to stop music is this, sound mixer stop all. So whenever I need to stop sound, there it is. Now, stopping sound is different than muting sound or pausing sound. We'll learn that later because stop is stop. And if you don't program it the right way, pause, this is different than pause and stop. We'll get to that later. I want to add this here so just so that we don't forget. It's very easy to forget this and then the code won't work. So we'll just add it here. And then, well, restart the game. We're going to set it up again. We, you're going to restart the game from the beginning. Later on, we'll set it up maybe save states and such. Uh, but this will just be movie clip. This route, go to, and go to and stop, go to and play. No, go to and play scene one or frame one of scene one, scene title. That's easy. So restarting the game in version one is just, yeah, take us back to the start of the game, the title. Now, of course, smarter ways is take us back to the last, to one level before we died, or um, do you want to start over with the pop-up? Maybe if we do it this way, go back to the title screen so that they can go over to the help screen to then lower the difficulty to easy. So many possibilities. Here we'll keep it easy. Just go back to the beginning. This is in the bad. And the game, I'll get to the bad ending. gets me. I go to the bad ending. Of course, I'm testing the I'm testing the new idea, but I'm also going to test the old idea in terms of I want to exit. Okay, that's working well. Oh, that's cool. Also, that um, restart button goes away when the pop up appears because I programmed it or I set it up that way. That's good. Go back here. Okay, so then I do a restart, and it's not going to confirm. It'll just do it. If I further want to do a confirmation, I have to do something like that pop-up, 
which is on its own frame, like let's say frame 10, it will pop up to um, confirm yes or no. Now, why can't I use the same pop-up? Why can't I use the same pop-up as, are you sure you want to exit? You have to, computers are dumb and you have to further program it. What do you mean? Because even though it makes sense, okay, I, I'm at the exit here. Can I just reuse this, are you sure? This are you sure is programmed about, are you sure you want to exit? It was not programmed to be smart enough to detect, did you click exit or did you click restart? Of course it could be programmed to detect which of those two. That's more, more code, more complication. From our knowledge at the moment, it's good enough that the way that the confirmation works is that it jumps to frame five to ask you, well, based on what we've learned so far, what if we set up the restart the same way, jump to frame 10, and on frame 10, we have an are you sure with its own yes, no. And if you click no, it jumps you back to frame one. If instead you click the restart and it jumps you to frame 10, and then you click the yes, then it jumps back to first scene. Well, at the moment, it just does it. No confirmation. You need the similar thing on the good ending. You notice, yeah, it goes back to the beginning and I can start again. So on the good ending, technically we can create a um, create a restart here. Logically, do we want to restart? Do we want to play the second quest? Do we want to go to a different um, uh, haunted house, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? We'll keep it very simple and just have a restart. Do I want to restart on a harder level? Many possibilities. It's just going to be restart. And in order to do that, it's going to be 99% of that. Button about restarting, run its code and restart, kill the sound, uh, which will make sense later. So I'm going to take this, all of this chunk right here is basically what I need on the good ending. There's a button that I will interact with. So it's just almost all of this the same. Copy that, go to the good ending. I don't have the, the good button yet, but I need the code. So the button's not there yet, but logically I know what I must do here. Button, end of good, restart. It's going to play its particular frame, the restart will be the same frame, frame five. That needs to match that. There's a listener here for that particular button. Then run some code. And I just leave it as is, this will work. This is gonna create an error that'll say duplicate function. I already created that function on the bad ending. A function has the same name, no matter, no matter what scene or frame it's at, it'll cause an error if it's the same one. What I might be able to do is if I just have something like that, which is saying, there's a button here, click on it and run a function. I already defined a function to restart the game. Can I do this? Yes, if the function definition is currently in memory, I can do that time saver. The reason that I could do this is that if I've got that function in memory, it'll keep remembering it and therefore run it. It's named wrong, but names don't matter. And therefore, this could work. Now, they keep saying could because if it's in memory, it's in memory when I go to the particular scene and frame where the code runs. So if I had gotten to the bad ending, the bad ending has that function definition. Bad ending has that function definition, putting it into memory. If I first get to the bad ending, this function will go into memory. Then if I manage to go to the good ending, this will work because bad ending restart is in memory. But if I'm so good, I never get to a bad ending. I never go to the line of code to put restart into memory. This will cause an error. 
Okay, that's a logic error, not a syntax error. You see the logic there. That doesn't exist in memory if I if I never go to the bad ending. I'm so good, I never died. One way to address that, I hinted that about that earlier, you can put all your function definitions on frame one of the game. Every function that I might use, go to help, go to main one, exit the game, uh, pick up the key, blah, blah, blah. Every function, I can put them on frame one then they'll always be in memory and I can use them anywhere in the game. I've been doing it the intro way where every listener and function is on the screen necessary. More advanced to think about for the future is all functions at the beginning of the game and then all listeners and such where they need to be. So for the good ending, to keep going with our intro of things, I will define a new function here related to the good end. If you feel you're a bit more advanced, do what I said, and the function of exiting the game is defined on frame one, and therefore I can just I just use the listener on the appropriate scene. Does that make sense? Yeah, just follow along. This is the end good to restart the game. This is the end good to restart the game. End good. Ultimately, it does the same thing. Stop whatever music might be playing, the triumphant music that we will add later, and then take us to the beginning of the game. Yeah, that's 99.9% .9 the same. Now, that's 100% that's the same as the bad ending restart, but we cannot have the same name. Two functions of the same name will cause an error. So new function, new name, new scene. Error. Same result, restart the game. Oops, I got an error there. I mistyped something. Uh, and button. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I got the code. Good. Don't have the button. Bad. Well, that's easy. Put the button again on the screen. Itself there. But the error checker told me there's an error. There's a button that doesn't exist that we're trying to show its frame and that we're trying to listen to. Error. So now, checker reminded me that that's on screen. That instance name. So there we go. We have the visual element as well as the text element, and then no error. And I will play the game. I will win the game. I know exit will work. That's the one without the are you sure. Um, I could test it to fully test it, but I'm going to do the restart from here, and we restart the game. So if we fully then want to set up more, like start over. Now you have the diamond armor. So much stuff we can do. But we've got at least start over. Before it was a dead end earlier at the start of today's lecture, that was a dead end. You have to restart the whole game. You see the restart is not that complicated. It's just uh, being sendings. So we added um, functionality to the good ending, the bad ending. Uh, one has a just do it. The other one has a are you sure first. It was those examples. As always, I'll put these examples up on Canvas. The last thing we'll do for today is we'll start to set up the character selection. We'll start to set up the character selection because that's going to require lots of setup. But we'll start with it at the moment. We'll see how far we go before we get to today's ending. And then when we come back next time, we're going to add music and then finish the character selection and other things. Starting to set up the character selection, um, 
we'll go back to the title screen. This is all going to be through code for the moment. The visual elements will come second. But here's all of our code so far on scene one, frame one. I'll go to the very, very, very end, and I'll do this. And this is like some of this extra stuff where you can um, create some visual element about, you know, character, select, code. You, you're not limited to writing the actual code in your code. You can write comments, as we've seen, but also you can write little visual markers like this. Like my next 20 lines of code is all about this. We, we've been commenting our code here and there, explaining it and the like. But one thing that more advanced people do when your code gets very complex is you visually mark it in ways as well. Notice this is working by adding the comment line you know, to really polish it like that. So what follows is character select code. And the idea is character select will be based on several characters to choose from each with different attributes. Purpose of having character selection is, well, this one's faster, this one's stronger, this one knows more magic, this one is whatever. You know, various characters have various attributes. The sky is the limit about what attributes you want. I'm gonna start easy with like three or four little attributes. Well, part of the reason also of attributes is, okay, how do those attributes then affect the game? Like if we select a character that, ha that has, I'm, again, I'm gonna go with like just classic D&D &D things of magic and power and intelligence and luck, you know, you can make up your own attributes. But let's say we're battling the boss and the character that you have has low power. So it's going to take 20 hits to kill the boss versus you chose the character that had higher power. It's going to take, you know, 11 hits to kill the boss. That's one reason why you might have attributes to affect other parts of the game. If we knew all of the code and had knew all of the possible code and we had all of the game perfectly mapped out, we would, of course, create the game in perfect sequence for the end result. We're doing it in this way that this is an idea we got later, and now we're going to retrofit it into what exists. Depending on what you're doing, some things will be easy to retrofit, to add on to, and other things will be difficult, and other things will be very difficult. So logically right here about now, I want to introduce characters that will affect different characters that affect the gameplay. Honestly, this leans more towards the difficult. If we had thought of this at the very beginning and added it from the beginning, making that a part of our game is easier. We have our game so far, and now we're gonna add something kind of complex so it's gonna to lean towards the more difficult. We're gonna do a version one, and then depending on our time, we do version two and such. We're gonna have a few different characters with different attributes that affect the game. Three lines of idea will then add up to like 50 lines or more of code. That's just the nature of it. So first, define the character objects properties. So there's some keywords here, object and property. In every programming language, we have objects and properties. Objects will be the character itself, and then properties will be what attributes it has. You know, what are other words for attributes? You know, Power, toughness, magic level, XP, HP, all those things are attributes. You might know them as some other some other word, but attributes, and then in a programming language, they're properties. We're defining the character or characters, their objects. 
It's the same VAR, create a variable, create a container. Actually, we had a container that is storing true or false. Do you have this object or not? Um, do you have, you know, what's your points, et cetera? You have these variables, these objects that store something. Here now we have one that is going to be more complex that will have attributes. But let's say in my case, we're going to have the classic uh, mage and fighter and thief and whatever. So we're going to have like three or four or whatever. So we're going to have a mage. Um, I'm going to call this thing, it's a mage. I'll call it M, capital M mage. It could be lowercase. It could be whatever. It could be mage one, whatever you want to call these things. Notice I'm calling it with a capital M to differentiate it with every other thing that has been lowercase. Is a special new kind of object. It doesn't matter, but the capital M will remind me it is a character. Previously, we've seen data types of Boolean. This variable will hold a Boolean. It will hold a number. It will hold a rectangle. It will hold, in this case, an object. This variable is going to be a complex object. That's what a character is, a complex object. Equal to, well, previously, if I had this set as number, it would say, okay, it's got the number one. Easy. Well, if I had the data type of Boolean, it would be equal to or full of a true. Okay. Here with this complex object, we have a new syntax. Curly braces. But well, we've seen curly braces before when we have created functions. There's a function called whatever, and it has all of these sub steps with curly braces. So looks different, but it's the same sort of idea. I'm going to group together a bunch of attributes have a specific syntax that we have to use. Creating an, creating an object, an element, calling it something. What does it store? It stores complex data. What's the complex data in here? That apart, as usual, you can comment right here for the um, notes. one character and all its various attributes. Okay, so what I want to do here is I want the character to have a name, a type, HP, MP, power, and luck. So I could do more or less of those attributes, but I'm going to start again this way. So the syntax then is, okay, this character will have a name. Seen before, however, is a reserved word. So I'm going to put C as in character name. You know, this, if this had, if this had some amount of, uh, you know, random power, or something random. Random is a reserved word. If I simply add something else to differentiate it, or you know, V my initial, then that it's going to make it unique. So I'm going to go with C name, character name. This will also have character um, type. It's a mage, but it's a type. We'll see why in a moment. This will have character hit points, HP. Character magic points, MP. Character power. How strong is it, I guess? Other things that we might want. And then what I want for the moment, character luck. How much luckiness does it have? So we're seeing the syntax here. There's a character that'll have attributes, and I can think of 50 more. It's speed. How fast does it move through the game? Character speed. Character SPD, whatever. I can name these how I want. Why don't I just call this, you know, lowercase luck? It's not a reserved word, but you should be in the habit of not using simple words, which may conflict with things that exist.
that. That's no such thing, but whatever. So, okay. Further on the syntax of each of these, there's a colon at the end of each of these. That's vaguely, as we've seen, there's an object with a type and there's a colon in between. There's an object and there's a type and then there's a colon. Sort of like this, there's a property and a colon and a value. Properties are the attributes that have values. The name of this one, quotes, this particular character has a name. Now, this is looking different than some of my other code. I'm not putting a semicolon at the end and such. I've got these various curly braces in different ways and such. And you'll get used to how it's written, but this one is a mage type of character. Uppercase versus lowercase. Yes, it matters. Why is this lowercase? It's okay for the moment. We'll put it lowercase y. I'll get to that later. Um, I'm going to go with the simple 25, 50, 75, 100. I have three or four different characters. You know, the mage is powerful with magic, but weak with power. And then the, the warrior is powerful with power, but weak with magic, just to do stuff. But let's say it's got hit points of 50. Why is that not in quotes? That's a number, not a word. The word victor, the word mage, is in quotes. The number 50 is not. You could write it in quotes. That'll cause weird issues because that's technically saying the word 50, but I don't want the word 50. I want the number 50. There is a difference between the number 50 and the word 50. Notice I'm putting a comma after each one of these. It points. The mage will have the, the highest magic, 100. It'll have the lowest power, 25. Okay, luck is going to be interesting here. I'm going to put gibberish for the moment. This one's going to be interesting because it's going to be related to actual random luckiness. Every time you play the game, they will have different luck. Luck is going to change every time. That's luck. Today you got lucky, tomorrow you didn't. So for the moment... That is going to be, for the moment, it's going to be gibberish. I just need to put something there. I will put it correctly in a moment. We're seeing the syntax here. Create a variable called whatever. It is an object. It is equal to these attributes. An attribute I'm calling CName, CType, CHP, CMP, CPOW, CLUCK. The particular value of that attribute is Victor, Mage, 50, 100, 22, and something. Syntax that I'm inventing is what I'm going to use to set up my seven characters. I'm going to do maybe one or two more. So I'll copy my syntax that I invented. I'll make a warrior. Just change the relevant parts of the character, leaving the luck gibberish for the moment. So my idea is different characters that have different attributes that affect the game in different ways. I have a mage that is more powerful with magic and therefore in a particular level of the game, mag having higher magic will do a certain result. If instead I pick the warrior, a certain level of the game where it's a little bit more important to have higher power, that character is going to matter. One more, thief. So, those things as they would make sense. And we'll say the thief is the weakest one of points, but 
they're sneaky. And so magic, they've also got low magic, actually the lowest magic, no magic at all. And the power is also low. And they're going to rely on luck, lots of luck. Um, so just creating characters with attributes here. And uh, so three characters, one, one a mage where its highest um, attribute is related to magic. The warrior, its highest attribute is related to power. The thief, the highest attribute is related to luck. Again, luck is temporary weird at the moment. And then I can make 20 more of these. And I can make 20 more attributes. You know, what other attributes might there be? Put them in the chat if you have some thoughts. Like what else, what else might be valuable for a character in this type of a game? What other attributes? What are, what are there's things that define a character? Would, would be useful or interesting, put them in the chat if you want. But we're seeing the syntax of it. This and this with a colon, comma, what's the next thing? This and this with a colon, what's the next thing? Until the final one, there's no final comma. Notice there, there's no final comma because there's nothing more. That's the end, no final comma. If other things like, speed so strong I have it as in my case power for power strength is power in my mind but we can change that to strength or whatever but yeah speed we could have c speed how fast the character is so maybe you know thinking thief has lots of speed so we can add c speed and give it a hundred and then put speeds on these others and put them as we wish in my case we're going to say that the thief is all about luck that's um Let's go on here. So uh, to find the character objects, we can say syntax, syntax. Of the VAR example colon object. So uh, set up a complex um, variable, aka object. Have uh, equal to curly braces. That's the collection. Set up the collection of uh, attributes, technically of properties and values. Got the uh, property in quotes, pretty much always in quotes, and then a colon, and then in quotes, uh, a value that is uh, set up the attribute. It's value, whether it is uh, text or numbers or other things. So value could be words, is known as a string, in quotes, numbers, quotes. So we're seeing here. Words versus numbers. So we're setting up these various characters behind the scenes. What does this kind of look like? Um, create the graphical things next time. But code-wise, we can do this. We can say trace. We can say um, age name. Age dot C name mage um, hit points. This is just examples. 
to show you that the way we then use what we created is like this. Um, power. The point is we're seeing, okay, the object name me or warrior or thief if I want to then access or reference one of these properties that I've defined we have the dot and then the property however I spelled it here if I just called it power well then that's going to be mage.power I'm not doing them all, just to kind of show some results. Uh, we'll do luck, which should be obvious. But um, point is, well, how do what do I do with this? Uh, we're defining characters later. Then, when we're going to battle the boss, let's think about this. When we go to the mini boss. We go to the screen of the mini boss and then we just start to battle it. What if I first check which character did you select at the beginning of the game? Oh, you selected the thief. Okay, then let's check what is the power of the thief. If the power is greater than this or less than that or equal to this or whatever, now the boss is going to have two times more power, two times less power, etc. This is all to eventually, ultimately, do some if-else or other AI to make a decision. We've got these various attributes of numbers, let's say, and based on a particular screen we go to, we compare the number of that character against something. And based on that comparison, that conditional statement, we make something happen in the screen. We'll get to it when we get to it. But again, this is our setup. And I want to see here when I run my game, I want to see this on the out output panel. It's We're not going to do anything yet, uh, but we're, I, I want to see that right here. So I just want to see down here. When I first start my game, okay, game is ready. Do I have the skull key? Oh, remember we did that stuff with the skull key. But here's the new stuff, mage name. And it says the name that we typed into the into the group of code. What are the hit points? There they are. There's its power. And then luckiness is, because it's gibberish, it's confused, but it's saying something. And so this is just to show you, how do I access? What do I do with this stuff? Let's say here I do mage.cpow is equal to 99. And now if I do the trace again of power, Logically, when the game starts, set all attributes, show them to me. Now the game has progressed somehow. I've leveled up. Show me the result. So saying equal. There's a particular character. It has a particular property. That dot there is very important. We're setting it equal to, not comparing, double equals is compare. We're setting it to something. And then I'll say, show it to me. So... Obviously, we would want to set that when we defeat the boss or we pick up the armor or whatever. But I'm just showing you that in the code here, it does what you tell it. We first defined the character, and it started off with power 25. And then something happened, and now the power is 99. This is just showing you. Create the character. Somehow alter the character. It's easy. Be to do and um, level up. Let's 
thing we'll do right here is the luck. Well, luck, I want luck to be lucky, luck to be random. Today, randomly, you're lucky. Tomorrow, you're not. Um, so this will be a little bit of random number generation. We did that a little bit already when we put the key on random places on screen. Well, we're going to do something similar to generate some luck. Each of the It was going to cause an error. That's why I put numbers here. But I'm going to change each of these to then say um, R and D luck. Things that were in quotes were words. These over here are numbers. Well, that's a word, but not a number. It's a variable. I'm going to put a variable into luck. And that variable is going to come from randomly picking a lucky number. So um, random luck parentheses square brackets. I'll explain that in a moment, but this is going to generate a random number and add it to luck. And maybe all of these three very luckily get, get a value of three. Maybe one of them has 99 and one has two and one has whatever. So we're going to set up a random number generator. That's what that code is. The random number generator. Well, before I try to add a random number here, I need to define what is this random generator. So I will back up, define the characters, define the random number generator. It does need to be in this order. If we make up the characters and then the generator down here, you'll get an error because we're trying to use a generator, but we haven't defined it. So you want to define the generator first and then use it but I wanted to put the code here of what does it mean to be a character? Define random luck generator. This is a function which is called rnd luck colon parentheses colon array. That's different. Previously, we've had this say function void because nothing happens technically as a result. This time something will happen. We get an array, a collection of data. I'll explain that in a moment. A collection of data. It's got the curly braces right here. Which I break apart. We've seen this before. There's a function um, that's going to run, but this time it's going to run when we create the character. It's going to randomly create some, um, some luck. So array to store a bunch of luck. V R A R R luck equal to square brackets. A variable, oops, and then right here, that is going to be an array. This is a uh, this is a variable called whatever that is going to be an array, an array, a collection of data. So we're creating an array. We're creating a group of data. This group of data will be luck, luck data. At the moment, the luck is empty. I want to create it with having a luck of 25 and a luck of 75 and a hundred, zero. I've created a group of data of units of luck, 25, 75, 100, and zero. Um, one of these will, will be chosen. 
randomly. So, it says if I know what possibilities of luck do I want, if I want to generate new luck every time, actually looking at the time here, um, instead of the more complex thing, we'll make it not too complex. Okay. Um, and I'll put the order this way. No luck, a little bit of luck. How do we want to do this? I guess all the way like this. Uh, no luck, kind of lucky, medium lucky, normal, I guess. Kind of lucky, very lucky. So there's these possibilities. One, two, three, four, five. So the... Um, the point here is this is your color. This is my random luck generator. Uh, not so random, actually. We might do it more randomly next time. But what we're saying here is possibilities of luck. Turn the luck. So turn, what does that mean? I'll explain that in a moment. Like this. Return the luck when asked. We can say it that way. Oops. So here's the possible luck that we might have. And just give me some luck. Okay, here's some luck. So over here, make you know, make some luck, get some luck. Case this particular the mage. We'll say the mage has average luck. So we have possibility of number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Weird thing with every programming language is that they don't start counting from one, like we would, a human would. It starts counting from zero. So array to store luck, counting, counting or keeping track. Zero. So if I want to say, what is the first item? I don't say, what is the first item? I say, what is the zero with item? Let me see if this was 99, just to not confuse. If I say, what's the, what's the zero with item? It's the first one. If I say, what's the item one? It's not this one. It's this one. Because we start from zero. This is just something to memorize. All programming languages do this. When you start to count, you don't count from one, you count from zero. So this is zero, one, two, three, four. Even though there's five things, we reference them as zero, one, two, three, four. So if I say, yeah, give me item five, there's no item five, there's an item four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Item four, the fifth item, zero, one, two, three, four. Yes, it's weird. All programming languages think like this. So keeping that in mind, if I want the mage to be medium lucky, that is okay. It's the third item, but we count zero, one, two again. Don't think that it's zero because I put zero. It is always zero. If this was XXX, that's not a real amount of luck. I'll just throw something there. That is a zero, one, two. Two. Okay, so I need a two right here. Give me position two, starting from zero. 50. The mage is lucky of 50. Well, why don't you just write 50? Because if we wanted a full number generator with more complexity, we're, we're setting ourselves up for the future. Yeah, warrior will have the lower luck, 25, which is zero. One. Okay, so the warrior is going to have a one right there. And I wanted the, the thief to be the luckiest one, the fifth item, but it's zero, one, two. Four. Thief will have four. Position four, item five. Now my code here, okay, this mage's name, its hit points, its power, its luck. Now that I don't have gibberish there, I'm saying from my collection of luck, get me position two, zero, one, two, the third item. 
the third item is 50. there because I should not put should, I should put real gibberish, not fake gibberish. That's a string, that's why it's getting confused. But it, I didn't put a zero there because you might think zero is zero. Mage is lucky a 50. Exactly. Second item is 50. Just to confirm it, what's the luck of the warrior? Okay. Warrior luckiness. Be the luck of the warrior. All my characters have the same attributes. C name, C type, C, HP, MP, POW, luck. They all have the same. They have different values. The luck value is based on a collection of possible luck. So that later we can make it really random. Right now, it's not really random. Later, we'll make it really random because we're about to end for today. But we're saying, give me one of those positions from the luck array. Okay, show me that. This warrior, show me its luck. So, the mage of luck is 50. The warrior luck is 25. It's all setting ourselves up so that eventually cool stuff happens. This is all the basic level zero. You need a little setup before you actually make it do something. And we're seeing even this is a big topic that we spent 40 minutes on without actually doing anything. But this reminds you again, games are complex. That's why all of this I'll add to Canvas, of course, and it's recording, of course, and I will do here to do. It randomly lucky. Right now it's not really random, but we're out of time for the day. But this random luck generator here has four possibilities of luck. Putting a null here just so that I'm never going to deal with zero. It's either going to be one or two or three or four. So I will never choose zero. So I'll nullify it. I'm going to choose two, one, two. I'm going to choose one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Fourth item. All of this is to set up that later, these um, attributes will affect gameplay. So we'll end at this point of my example code here so you can review it. There's no homework this week. We obviously are gonna continue with the music on um, Wednesday and then come back to this. There's the homework from last week that is due tomorrow. Review the assignment on that. This week is adding more to our skill set. Next week will be the um, homework about what we learned previously to add to it. And then we'll move along. We'll get to that when we get to it. We'll end at this point. We'll do some lab time if you need it. Check the assignment and... Uh, we're going and marking things off of our to-do list. This one is the starting to put, starting to get together the character select. We have a character select because we have attributes of different characters. We're getting there little by little.